Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad to see all of you this morning. I know today is Halloween, but for right now, we are officially celebrating Reformation Day. That's what we do here in church. So happy Reformation Day. I know everyone's probably like, oh, okay, well, that's not what I was expecting. Well, happy, four, happy 504th Reformation Day on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the cathedral door in Wittenberg, Germany. And we've been, and that's kind of why we're here today. Uh, so that's why we have uh, the red pyramid on the communion table. That's why I'm wearing my red stole today because today is Reformation Day. And I know all of you got the note to dress like your, your favorite reformer today, <laughs> but I don't see anybody really do that. So... I guess we'll just have to do that next year. But anyway, happy Reformation Day to you all. Happy Halloween to all of you. And uh, believe it or not, we'll be in November tomorrow. So enjoy today while you can. I welcome uh, all of you who uh, are visitors today, and I'm glad to see you. Uh, and welcome to our worship today. If you're not scared by me already, I'm glad. Uh, and hope that you are, uh, this time we, ha we have together is uplifting to you as we're in each other's presence and in the presence of our Lord. Uh, if you could, at the end of your uh, pews, there's a red welcome folder. If you could just sign those, uh, let us know that you're here. I always forget to do that. I need to remember to try, even the people who are always here, uh, constantly, those are, that's a good sign for us to know that you're here and we give you credit, um, whatever that's worth, we, we just, you know, make sure you're here. So please sign your red welcome folders uh, as you can and pass it down the line. Since today is Halloween, we'll be doing our trunk or treat later on at four o'clock in the back, uh, uh, back parking lot. So you're more than welcome to join us for that. It'll be a, a good time as we hand out candy and have some soup and hot chocolate and just have a good time together. <clears throat> also, with November just a few hours away, uh, next week we uh, would like to honor our veterans, those who are members of our congregation who are veterans, both past and present, and we like to put an insert in the bulletin uh, to list those, uh, but we want to make sure that all the information is correct and up to date, so on the table out in the commons area, we have a list, we have the list of our veterans. And if you could just swing by, if you or a loved one is on that list or you would like to add to that list, just swing on by after service and uh, make sure what we have is correct so that we can properly honor those who served next Sunday. This Thursday, the first Thursday of the month, will be Women's Association uh, downstairs in Fellowship Hall at noon. All the women of the church are invited to participate. And also Saturday is the first Saturday of the month, and so we'll have men's ministry here in the commons area. It'll be bring your own breakfast again. Uh, that seems to be doing well enough. And uh, we had a really good crowd last month, or I guess it's still technically this month, a few weeks ago, and we hope to keep that going. So if, you, if all the men of the church are welcome to, to, to come on Saturday as well at 9 o'clock. And next Sunday, to make sure that nobody is super early, remember to set your clocks back one hour next Saturday night before you go to bed. You get an extra hour, so use it wisely. <laughs> or use it however you want, I guess. But set it back an hour. We fall back an hour. Uh, so make sure. But I guess if you want to be here super early on Sunday, that's up to you as well. All right, those are all the announcements I have. Are there any others? Kathy. Okay, it's finally, oh goodness. <laughs> it's finally here, today's our trunk and treat. It's from four to six down in the north parking lot. Um, for everyone who's helping or doing a trunk, I need to have everybody set up and ready to go by 3.30 this afternoon because I'd like to take photos. Um, we're also moving the chili and the, the soup and the hot chocolate's gonna be moved inside in the downstairs um, in the fellowship hall. I would love to have some more volunteers to help down there with Kathleen 
in serving that. And we also will have prizes for first, second, and third places that the people coming through the trunk and treat will be voting on. Um, parking will be up here in this parking lot. If you want, you can park down on, this no on the farther end and just walk in the street to come in. Or if you want to come in through the building and down through the elevator, that's fine also. Just make sure that we're quiet when we come in, if we're here before 4 o'clock or around there because the Chin Church is still in service. And, and I want to just thank everybody who's already participating and helping out with this. Now, we're going to switch gears. <laughs> Um, you know, you all know me as a volunteer with activities like Trunk and treat, treat and Christmas Boxes, and we're always proud of our volunteers, and we work for free. But the church still needs to have pledges to maintain our building, pay utilities, janitorial, make repairs, and pay staff. The pledge drive begins in November. You'll be getting a letter with your pledge card from, for the coming year. Pledges help us make it through a tough time. Northwest Hills is still here, and pledges will help us to continue our ministry doing the Lord's work for the next year. Thank you. Any other announcements for the good of the fellowship? We'll, we'll, we'll welcome them and wait, wait for them to join us here in a second. But if there are none, would you please rise as you are able and greet one another in the peace and love of Christ. To begin our worship this morning, let us join together in our invitation to worship, We Will Glorify. Because today is the 504th anniversary of Reformation, uh, we sing one of Martin Luther's most famous hymns, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
And if you would indulge me for just a few minutes, I want to talk about the, the, the lyrics of a, a Mighty Fortress is Our God, just for a second, so bear with me. But I think it's a beautiful hymn. It's, uh, it's, in, it's in a paraphrase of Psalm 46, which is a beautiful psalm that God is our refuge and strength, uh, an ever-present help in times of danger. And, and I imagine that this was very important to Martin Luther because he himself went through quite a few times of danger and stress. And I imagine he thought the spiritual enemy was always after him. He, uh, he, he sought to reform some things within the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, that didn't quite um, come, that didn't, didn't, wasn't met with open arms by, at that time, Pope Leo X, as well as the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. But there's two important phrases that I want to focus on within this song and in the, the third, and fourth, uh, third and fourth verses. In the, in the middle of verse three, it says, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. It's a thought that, you know, there's, there's things around us going on where we're, we're always, in, we're, we're in some kind of spiritual dark time. But yet, he says his, his doom is sure. The prince of darkness's doom is sure. And why? Because one little word shall fell him. Now we end that verse kind of on a question of, well, what's that word? What's the word that can fell the prince of darkness? And Martin Luther begins the fourth verse with, the word that is above all earthly powers. And it's the, the, the word that says that the spirit and the gifts are ours. What is that word? It's the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the word that, one little word, defeats the evil one, defeats the darkness, defeats what goes on around us. And then he ends this song with, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. Again, I think of probably his time on the run when he was a wanted man, a wanted criminal, because he sought to restore the truth of the gospel. And that also speaks to the words of Psalm 46 that although this world may beat us down, it, it, the evils of the world may kill us, this is what is true, that God's truth abideth still and his kingdom is forever. And I think that'll preach. <laughs> That's the truth that Martin Luther sought to, 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 to proclaim, and that is what we proclaim every Sunday morning. That is what we proclaim in our lives as Christians, that though the world may overcome us, Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. So let us join together in our unison prayer, printed in the bulletin or on the screen. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, your faithful people. Keep us in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against evil and grant to your church your saving peace. We pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen.
Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Paula. Kathy already did the stewardship moment within the announcement section, but I just wanted to mention or reiterate what she said that probably a lot of you may have already gotten your stewardship letter uh, in the mail. We sent it out Thursday and we have another uh, insert in the bulletin about, about that time of the year. I know it's everybody's favorite time of the year when we have to talk about giving and money and things like that, but uh, it is important for the church and uh, I hope that you take the time to think about, uh, again, not that we just need, we, we need money, but what, what we can do for the kingdom whether it's through our time, through our talents, through our voices, our minds, our hands, our feet. Uh, those are all stewardship things, all things that can be um, used and implemented into to doing good things in Jesus' name. So we'll be working on that and talking about that more next week and in the weeks to come. We move on to our scripture reading for this morning. We are... We're still continuing, but we're, we're getting close to wrapping up our, uh, our series on the parables of Jesus. There's many more we could probably go through, but we're going on a, some, uh, we're talking about specific ones. And right now we're in Matthew chapter 25, reading verses 1 through 13. <coughs> Excuse me. If you'd like to follow along, it is on page 702 in your pew Bibles. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins took up, woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some, of your, some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. How do all of you feel about waiting? Do you enjoy a nice long wait? Well, for me, it, it, it kind of depends on my mood and what I'm doing or what I'm going to do. Let's take, for example, that I'm standing in line at the post office waiting for stamps. Now, if I'm not in a, a big hurry to, to get someplace else, and if I'm in a good mood, I, I can usually stand in line eh, pretty well. But then there can be other times where my anger flares up every minute that passes that I don't get to the counter. Now, it can get even worse if I'm waiting for something like a gift or a present and I know exactly what I'm getting and I know exactly when I'm getting it. And the waiting can be pretty tough for me at that time. How are you with waiting? I'm assuming by the chuckles that I heard a little bit a little bit ago that some of us probably do agree with the one phrase that Tom Petty sang, wait, the waiting is the hardest part. But how about waiting until the end of time? Does that sound fun? 
Well, that's the topic at hand in our passage from Matthew's gospel today. At this point in the gospel, Jesus is sitting with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, which is just outside of the city of Jerusalem. And at this point, he is talking all about the end of time. Jesus and his disciples sitting on the Mount of Olives, I I don't think is an insignificant fact that Matthew threw into this section. In Zechariah chapter 14, the prophet looks forward to a day when God will stand on the Mount of Olives and be recognized as king over all the earth. And the prophet says that that day is coming. And so I think that imagery with what this parable is trying to tell us illustrates this truth. That God is coming, the king is coming. The parable opens with a familiar phrase, one that we have heard often in this series on Jesus' parables. The kingdom of heaven will be like, or is like. The kingdom is portrayed by some bridesmaids who are preparing for the groom to arrive so that the wedding banquet may begin. Now, if this sounds like familiar imagery, you are exactly right. We had a parable not that long ago that equated the kingdom of heaven to a wedding party. And here we have it again. Imagery of a wedding banquet, again, connects to the messianic banquet that is supposed to be, to be at the end of time. But I think it's also something that the original hearers, such as the, the disciples, would have instantly connected with, and something that we can connect with as well. Wedding parties are huge events. They were in the first century, and they still are today. Brides and grooms can spend many months and many dollars on creating the perfect wedding reception. But what I think is a little bit different compared from our day to the first century is that wedding banquets of the first century could have lasted up to seven days. Now that, that's a party. Imagine, imagine doing a wedding reception for seven days in today's world. Um, I think most, most of us would be broke, even more than we are already. Imagine spending that much on wine or food or whatever. But this is a big event. A wedding in somebody's life is a big event. And the procession of the bride and groom marked the beginning of this big event and joyous event. Now apparently this procession is happening at night, which if I were planning the, the, the party, I'm not sure I would have put it at night, because I don't know, I stumble over things at night, so I'd rather have it during the day, but this one is at night. And it's assumed that the bridesmaids are waiting for the arrival of the groom. And they are waiting to greet him and process with him with their lamps of light. They're the ones who are ushering him in and guiding him in the darkness. Now the bridesmaids could have been waiting either at the bride's home and they're waiting for the groom to come fetch the bride and then take all the party back to his house or they could be waiting at the groom's family home where the wedding will ultimately take place. But the point is whether they're waiting at the bride's house or the groom's house is that they're waiting and they have their lamps lit in anticipation for the groom's arrival. But here is where it comes the first wrinkle in the story. The groom is delayed. Now, this wasn't necessarily an uncommon occurrence. For example, one reason why the groom could be delayed is that when the groom went to the bride's house, the father of the bride decided to re-enter into negotiations between the gifts that were to be exchanged. Maybe the father of the bride thought he was being 
uh, shorted on something, and so they wanted to renegotiate, and that's why the groom and the bride are held up. In all honesty, it doesn't really matter why the groom is delayed. The point is that the groom is, is delayed, that's the point, and that the bridesmaids should have anticipated that this might occur. The delay, I think, is a connection to what Jesus said in the previous chapter, chapter 24, specifically verse 44. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So due to the groom's delay and also the late hour, it's dark, it's night, all the bridesmaids fall asleep. And this is where the second wrinkle of the story comes into play. Five of the bridesmaids brought extra oil for their lamps, but five did not. And so the five who brought the extra oil, Jesus calls the wise ones. Well, the five who did not bring extra oil are called the foolish ones. And this this little detail comes into play because at midnight, the maids are awakened at the announcement of the groom's arrival. And so after they've become awakened, probably shed the, the, the sleep from their eyes, they begin preparing their lamps for the procession. But to the horror of the foolish set of five, they discovered that they don't have enough oil. Their oil has burned as they've slept and they're not sure they have enough for the procession. And so they turn to the five wise bridesmaids and they ask for some of their oil, but but they say, no, if we share, none of us are going to have enough. And so they tell the five foolish maids to go find some oil from from a dealer. Now, to those of us sitting here today, we we know that the first century did not have a 24-hour Walmart that people could go to to buy oil in the middle of the night. I don't know if there were 24-hour oil salesmen in the first century. And to be honest, it, it doesn't really matter because somehow, I guess, they find some oil. The, the five foolish maids find some oil. But the, the, the trouble or the, the danger or the damage has already been done because while they were away trying to find extra oil, the bridegroom arrives and the wedding party begins, minus the five foolish bridesmaids. Now the foolish ones eventually do arrive, but they're denied entrance into the banquet by the groom. Although these bridesmaids were chosen to accompany the bride and the groom, it seems as if their role as bridesmaids did not guarantee them a place at the banquet. They were initially a part of the wedding party, but they walked away because they didn't have lit lamps, at least for a little while. They did not plan for the long time of waiting. Now Jesus summarizes the point of his parable in verse 13 where he says, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. And so the main point of this is that as the bridesmaids were to be vigilant for the coming of the groom, all readers of Matthew's gospel are called to live in the same anticipation, the same vigilant waiting for Christ's return. Now, as with all parables, there have been debate over the symbolism in the parable. And I think the one symbol that really gets a lot of attention in this parable is the oil. Because really the only difference between all of the 10 bridesmaids is the amount of oil that they carry to light their lamps. So then what does the oil represent? Well, there could be a few possibilities. They kind of all work in some ways together, 
But I think one possibility lies with the, bride, the bridegroom's harsh retort to the bridesmaids at the gate, to the five foolish bridesmaids. He tells them that he does not know them. Again, a little weird because you would assume that he'd know them at least at some level, but he claims to not know them. And the women are not let into the wedding banquet because of that lack of knowledge. And so therefore, I think perhaps the oil might represent the idea of knowing Christ. When Christ returns someday, whenever that may be, there will be people who are caught off guard simply because they didn't know Jesus. And so because of their lack of of knowing Jesus, they will miss out on the festivities of the kingdom. I think another potential understanding of the oil comes from an understanding of the oil through the Hebrew scriptures, through what we call the Old Testament. Oil was used as a symbol of, of God's presence, especially God's presence through the Holy Spirit. Kings and priests alike were anointed with oil, sometimes even covered with oil, as a sign that they were consecrated, they were set aside for a holy work as kings, as priests, and that this oil represented that they were now filled with God's Holy Spirit to do the work and ministry that they were entrusted to do. And so perhaps this oil is representing some kind of work of the Holy Spirit here. Maybe the the Spirit's ministry is lacking here. It's kind of a connection to the knowledge because one of the aspects of the Holy Spirit's ministry is to lead us to a deeper understanding, a deeper relationship with Jesus. So maybe these foolish bridesmaids didn't quite have enough understanding or uh, enough attuneness or enough guidance from the Holy Spirit. Perhaps they lacked the the Spirit's seal on their lives, the, the seal to the invitation to the party. And that's why they were denied entrance. If one of these understandings or something like it is truly the case, then I think the great danger for these foolish ones is a half-baked faith. They have some oil, but clearly not enough. It's a faith that at a base level recognizes Jesus, but doesn't quite fully connect with him, doesn't quite fully seek him. It's a faith that I think embraces Jesus when it's easy, but, we, but then turns to something else when things become hard. It's a faith that we may do what Jesus wants to do, but when, it be, when Jesus asks us to do something that we're like, oh, I don't really want to do that, then it's a, it's a faith that says, eh, no thanks. And then we go do something else with our time. It's a faith that when times get tough, when we need a genuine connection, a genuine faith, we're caught off guard and we don't know what to do. But I think the wise are the ones who have tapped into that never ending reservoir of the the Holy Spirit's flame of life. They're the ones who have enough oil that have found that deeper level that have intimately connected with Jesus so that when things get tough, when the pressure levels begin to bear down or the wait for Jesus to come to our side seems to become overbearing. They have that oil in their tank. 
They have that light that continues to shine even when things around them get really dark. Again, all of the bridesmaids are waiting. And all of us sitting here this morning are waiting for Jesus to return. That's nothing new. That's been that way for 2,000 years. But I think what this parable is trying to put forward to us is the emphasis on how we wait. How are we waiting for Jesus? Are we living in anticipation for his return? Are we prepared for when he comes back? Excuse me. It reminds me of a time, this is a kind of a silly example, but I think it works. There was a time that I went to an Omaha Storm Chasers baseball game back in the spring. And before we went out to the game, uh, I looked at the forecast and I saw that the game would start in the temperatures in the lower 60s, which for springtime, that's really nice. But as the game progressed and the sun went down, it would, you know, get a little cooler, maybe into the lower 50s, maybe upper, or lower 50s, upper 40s, which, you know, I think wouldn't be so bad. And I debated taking my coat with me, but ultimately I was a tough Midwestern guy and I thought, eh, I don't need a coat. Well, fast forward a few hours and quite a few innings into the game. And as I shivered in my seat, I desperately wished I had brought my coat. And my mom is here this morning and I can, I can already hear in her head how she would not have approved of my actions. I, would have, I, I probably should have, I could have caught a cold. I, who knows what could have happened, right mom? Yep. She, I can hear her say, you should have been prepared. I was, I was foolish. I did not prepare. I knew, I even knew what I should have done, but I didn't. And I think as Christians, that's the lesson we need to avoid. We, we know what we're supposed to do. We're called to be prepared. We're called to be alert. We're called to live in vigilance as we wait for Jesus' return. And so the question becomes, do we have enough oil in our lamps? Do we, do we have that connection to the Spirit's deep, deep power to keep us going until Jesus returns? Because Jesus' return might be a little while yet. I don't know, nobody knows, only, only God knows. But he is returning. He promised that. He promised that he would come back. I just don't want any of us this morning sitting out in the cold, shivering, hoping and wishing that we had been prepared rather than sitting in on the grand wedding banquet that is to come. Let's be prepared. Let's wait in anticipation. Let us pray. Father, you know that we are stubborn and impatient people. We always want to know how things will end we want to know what the schedule is. Even holding and determining the schedule. Yet you remind us that we are not the center of the universe. You are. You orchestrate the universe. You set the stars in their places. And you work in your timing. Not ours. Your son Jesus told us to be ready to have the necessary oil in our lamps for when he returns. So why is it so hard for us to be continually ready? 
Help us to place you at the center of our lives, seeking to daily prepare ourselves, seeking the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we await the return of Jesus. O oh God, on this Reformation Day, we reflect on how your faithful people have sought to reshape your church for your glory. We thank you for how good you've been to us, how you've blessed us beyond measure, and how you walk with us always, even from the beginning. And so we pray that the church continues to be a beacon of hope, of grace, of love, and of light in the world. May our doors here at Northwest Hills Church always be open to those who need you. May our arms and hands reach out to those who have been hurt, who have been abandoned, who have been rejected. And may our actions reflect your mercy and love for all. Oh God, also around this time of year, we <clears throat> remember our loved ones who have gone before us into your glorious presence. We remember the love that we had for them, the love we received from them, and the love we shared with them. Yet we celebrate that their faith has finally been realized. That their years of toiling on this earth has been met with Christ's glorious and welcoming presence. We may still be saddened that they are gone from this life, but we are thankful for their memories and we ultimately celebrate that they have received their eternal reward. Yet we ask for you to help us to remain faithful until we too join all the saints throughout history in your eternal and grand kingdom. God, we also pray for those who are still among us who need your help. We especially pray for Nikki O'Neill and her family on the loss of her sister-in-law, Danita. We pray for her brother, Tom, that they may receive your strength and peace in their difficult time. We also lift the prayers that are deep on our hearts, the prayers only you can hear. We pray all these things, trusting in your goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We still continue to have our offering uh, plate in the back by the sound booth. So thank you to those who uh, dropped those off on your way in. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, may, if you would like to drop off, if you haven't already, you can do so on your way out. But in thanksgiving for the good gifts that God has given us and that we return to the, to the work of his church, would you please rise as you are able and let us sing together our doxology.
join together in our prayer of dedication. Thank you, Lord God, for the gifts you have given us. Help us to not rely on our own understanding in the use of these gifts, but to seek your wisdom in blessing people near and far. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join together in our hymn, Christ is made the sure foundation. May you go forth from this place in the power of the Holy Spirit, loving God and serving his people in all that we do and say. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.